No life organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for eighty years, and might stand for eighty more. Within, walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there, walked alone. Dr. John Montague was a doctor of philosophy. He had taken his degree in anthropology, feeling obscurely that in this field he might come closest to his true vocation, the analysis of supernatural manifestations. He was scrupulous about the use of his title because, his investigations being so utterly unscientific, he hoped to borrow an air of respectability, even scholarly authority, from his education. It had cost him a good deal, in money and pride, since he was not a begging man, to rent Hill House for three months. But he expected absolutely to be compensated for his pains by the sensation following upon the publication of his definitive work on the causes and effects of psychic disturbances in a house commonly known as Haunted. Dr Montague's intentions with regard to Hill House derived from the methods of the intrepid 19th century ghost hunters. He was going to go and live in Hill House and see what happened there. He decided to engage assistants. He combed the records of the psychic societies, the back files of sensational newspapers, the reports of parapsychologists, and assembled a list of names of people who had, in one way or another, been involved in abnormal events. Each of these people then received a letter from Dr. Montague extending an invitation to spend all or part of the summer at a comfortable country house, old but perfectly equipped with plumbing, electricity, central heating and clean mattresses. The purpose of their stay, the letters stated clearly, was to observe and explore the various unsavoury stories which had been circulated about the house for most of its eighty years of existence. Dr. Montague had four replies. To the four who replied, Dr. Montague wrote again, naming a specific day when the house would be officially regarded as ready for occupancy, and enclosing detailed directions for reaching it. On the day before he was to leave for Hill House, Dr. Montague was persuaded to take into his select company a representative of the family who owned the house, a certain Luke Sanderson. Then a telegram arrived from one of his candidates, backing out with a clearly manufactured excuse. Another never came or wrote, perhaps because of some pressing personal problem which had intervened. The other two came. Eleanor Vance was 32 years old when she came to Hill House. The only person in the world she genuinely hated, now that her mother was dead, was her sister. She disliked her brother-in-law and her five-year-old niece, and she had no friends. This was owing largely to the eleven years she had spent caring for her invalid mother, which had left her with some proficiency as a nurse and an inability to face strong sunlight without blinking. She could not remember ever being truly happy in her adult life. Her years with her mother had been built up devotedly around small guilts and small reproaches, constant weariness and unending despair. Without ever wanting to become reserved and shy, she had spent so long alone with no one to love that it was difficult for her to talk, even casually, to another person, without self-consciousness and an awkward inability to find words. Her name had turned up on Dr. Montague's list because one day, when she was twelve years old and her sister was eighteen, and their father had been dead for not quite a month. Showers of stones had fallen on their house, without any warning or any indication of purpose or reason. 
the stones continued intermittently for three days, during which time Eleanor and her sister were less unnerved by the stones than by the neighbours and sightseers who gathered daily outside the front door, and by their mother's blind, hysterical insistence that all of this was due to malicious, backbiting people who had had it in for her ever since she came. After three days, Eleanor and her sister were removed to the house of a friend, and the stones stopped falling, nor did they ever return. The story had been forgotten by everyone, except the people Dr. Montague consulted. It had certainly been forgotten by Eleanor and her sister, each of whom had supposed at the time that the other was responsible. During the whole underside of her life, ever since her first memory, Eleanor had been waiting for something like Hill House. Caring for her mother, lifting a cross old lady from her chair to her bed, setting out endless little trays of soup and oatmeal, stealing herself to the filthy laundry, Eleanor had held fast to the belief that some day something would happen. She had accepted the invitation to Hill House by return of post. It was the first genuinely shining day of summer, a time of year which brought Eleanor always to aching memories of her early childhood, when it had seemed to be summer all the time. She could not remember a winter before her father's death on a cold, wet day. She had taken to wondering lately, during these swift-counted years, what had been done with all those wasted summer days? How could she have spent them so wantonly? Nothing is ever really wasted, she believed sensibly, even one's childhood. And then each year, one summer morning, the warm wind would come down the city street where she walked, and she would be touched with a little cold thought. I have let more time go by. Yet this morning, driving the little car which she and her sister owned together, apprehensive lest her sister and brother-in-law might realise that she had just taken it away, she smiled out at the sunlight, slanting along the street, and thought, I'm going, I'm going, I have finally taken a step. At the last traffic light in the city, before she turned to go onto the road out of town, she stopped, waiting and slid Dr. Montague's letter out of her purse. I will not even need a map, she thought. He must be a very careful man. Take the motorway to Ashton, the letter said, and then turn left at exit five, going west. Follow this for a little less than thirty miles, and you'll come to the small village of Hillsdale. Go through Hillsdale to the corner, with a petrol station on the left and a church on the right and turn left here, onto what seems to be a narrow country road. You will be going up into the hills, and the road is very poor. Follow this road to the end, about six miles, and you will come to the gates of Hill House. The light changed. She turned left, and was free of the city. No one, she thought, can catch me now. They don't even know which way I'm going. She stopped for lunch after she had driven a hundred miles and a mile. She found a country restaurant which advertised itself as an old mill and found herself seated, incredibly, upon a balcony over a dashing stream. The only other people in the dining room were a family party, a mother and a father with a small boy and girl, and they talked to one another softly and gently. And once, the little girl turned and regarded Eleanor with frank curiosity and, after a minute, smiled. She wants her cup of stars, the little girl's mother said. Eleanor looked up, surprised. The little girl was sliding back in her chair, sullenly refusing her milk, while her father frowned and her brother giggled and her mother said calmly, she wants her cup of stars. Indeed, yes, Eleanor thought. Indeed, so do I. A cup of stars, of course. 
Her little cup, her mother was explaining, smiling apologetically at the waitress. It has stars in the bottom, and she always drinks her milk from it at home. She calls it her cup of stars because she can see the stars while she drinks her milk. The waitress nodded, unconvinced, and the mother told the little girl, You'll have your milk from your cup of stars tonight when we get home. But just for now, just to be a very good little girl, will you take a little milk from this glass? Don't do it, Eleanor told the little girl. Insist on your cup of stars. Once they have trapped you into being like everyone else, you'll never see your cup of stars again. Don't do it. And the little girl glanced at her and smiled a little subtle, dimpling, wholly comprehending smile and shook her head stubbornly at the glass. Brave girl, Eleanor thought. Wise, brave girl. When they left, the little girl waved goodbye to Eleanor, and Eleanor waved back, sitting in joyful loneliness to finish her coffee while the gay stream tumbled along below her. I have not very much farther to go, Eleanor thought. I'm more than halfway there. Journey's end, she thought. And far back in her mind, sparkling like the little stream, a tag end of a tune danced through her head, bringing distantly a word or so. In delay there lies no plenty, she thought. In delay there lies no plenty. Turn left at exit five, going west, Dr. Montague's letter said, and as efficiently and promptly as though he had been guiding her from some spot far away, it was done. She was on the road going west, and her journey was nearly done. Eleanor's little car stumbled and bounced, reluctant to go farther into these unattractive hills, where the day seemed quickly drawing to an end under the thick, oppressive trees on either side. They do not really seem to have much traffic on this road, Eleanor thought wryly, turning the wheel quickly to avoid a particularly vicious rock ahead. Six miles of this will not do the car any good. And for the first time in hours, she thought of her sister and laughed. By now they would surely know she had taken the car and gone. Everything is different. I am a new person, very far from home. The tree branches brushed against the windscreen and it grew steadily darker. Hill House likes to make an entrance, she thought. I wonder if the sun ever shines along here. Over the trees occasionally, between them and the hills, she caught glimpses of what must be the roofs, perhaps a tower, of Hill House. She turned her car onto the last stretch of straight drive, leading her directly, face to face, to Hill House, and, moving without thought, pressed her foot on the brake to stall the car, and sat, staring. The house was vile. She shivered and thought, the words coming freely into her mind. Hill House is vile. It is diseased. Get away from here at once. Eleanor brought her hand up to the heavy iron knocker, determined to make more noise and yet more, so that Hill House might be very sure she was there. And then the door opened without warning. Mrs. Dudley, Eleanor said, catching her breath. I'm Eleanor Vance. I'm expected. Silently, the woman stood aside. Her apron was clean, her hair was neat, 
and yet she gave an indefinable air of dirtiness. The hall in which they stood was over full of dark wood and weighty carving, dim under the heaviness of the staircase. On either side of them were great double doors. When Eleanor tried to speak, her voice was drowned in the dim stillness. Can you take me to my room? she asked at last, gesturing towards her suitcase on the floor and watching the wavering reflection of her hand going down and down into the deep shadows of the polished floor. I gather I'm the first one here. You, uh, you did say that you were Mrs. Dudley, the housekeeper. I think I'm going to cry, she thought. Mrs. Dudley turned and started up the stairs, and Eleanor took up her suitcase and followed. No, she thought. I don't like it here. Mrs. Dudley came to the top of the stairs, crossed the hall, and opened a door, perhaps at random. This is the blue room, she said. Eleanor moved gratefully toward the light from the room. How nice, she said, standing in the doorway, but only from the sense that she must say something. It was not nice at all, and only barely tolerable. It held enclosed the same clashing disharmony that marked Hill House throughout. Mrs. Dudley turned aside to let Eleanor come in and spoke, apparently to the wall. I set dinner on the dining room sideboard at six sharp, she said. You can serve yourselves. I clear up in the morning. I have breakfast ready for you at nine. That's the way I agreed to do. Eleanor nodded, standing uncertainly in the doorway. I don't stay after I set out dinner, Mrs. Dudley went on. Not after it begins to get dark. I leave before dark comes. Oh, Eleanor said. No one lives any nearer than the town. No one else will come any nearer than that. In the night, Mrs. Dudley said, and smiled outright. In the dark, she said, and closed the door behind her. Theodora. That was as much name as she used. Her sketches were signed Theo, and on her apartment door and the window of her shop and her telephone listing and her pale stationery, the name was always only Theodora. Theodora had come onto Dr Montague's list because, going laughing into the laboratory, she had somehow been able to identify correctly 18 cards out of 20, 15 cards out of 20, 19 cards out of 20, held up by an assistant out of sight and hearing. Theodora had been entertained by Dr Montague's first letter and answered it out of curiosity, yet fully intended to decline the invitation. Yet, when Dr Montague's confirming letter arrived, Theodora had been tempted and had somehow plunged blindly, wantonly, into a violent quarrel with the friend with whom she shared an apartment. Things were said on both sides, which only time could eradicate. Theodora had written that night, accepting Dr Montague's invitation, and departed in cold silence the next day. Eleanor was standing with her back to the window, telling herself that she was not afraid at all, when she heard, far below, the sounds of a car door slamming and then quick footsteps up the steps and across the veranda. Almost laughing, Eleanor ran across the room and into the hall. Oh, thank heaven you're here, she said, peering through the dimness. Thank heaven somebody's here. She was breathless and seemed unable to stop talking. Her usual shyness melted away by relief. My name's Eleanor Vance, she said, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm Theodora. Just Theodora. This bloody house. It's just as bad up here. Come on up. Make her give you the room next to mine. Theodora came up the heavy stairway after Mrs Dudley. It's the home I've always dreamed of, she said. Green room, Mrs Dudley said coldly, and Eleanor sensed with a quick turn of apprehension that flippant or critical talk about the house bothered Mrs Dudley in some manner. 
Good Lord, Theodora said, looking sideways at Eleanor. How perfectly enchanting. A positive bower. I set dinner on the dining room sideboard at six sharp, Mrs Dudley said. You can serve yourselves. You're frightened, Theodora said, watching Eleanor. It was just when I thought I was alone, Eleanor said. I'm here now, Theodora said. So it's all right. We have a connecting bathroom, Eleanor said absurdly. The rooms are exactly alike. I leave before dark comes, Mrs Dudley went on. No one can hear you if you scream in the night, Eleanor told Theodora. She realised that she was clutching at the doorknob and, under Theodora's quizzical eye, unclenched her fingers and walked steadily across the room. We'll have to find a way of opening these windows, she said. So there won't be anyone around if you need help, Mrs Dudley continued. In the night, she smiled. In the dark, and she closed the door behind her. Did I understand correctly, Theodora said, that Mrs Dudley is not going to come if we scream in the night? It is not what she agreed to, said Eleanor. Look, do you think we have to sit around here in our rooms and wait? I'd very much like to get this roof off from over my head. It gets dark so early. Eleanor went to the window again, but there was still sunlight slanting across the lawn. It won't be really dark for nearly an hour. I want to go outside and roll on the grass. The sun went down smoothly behind the hills. There were already long shadows on the lawn as Eleanor and Theodora came up the path towards the side veranda of Hill House. There's someone waiting there, Eleanor said, walking more quickly, and so saw Luke for the first time. Journey's end in lovers' meeting, she thought, and could only say inadequately, Are you looking for us? He had come to the veranda rail, looking down at them in the dusk, and now he bowed with a deep, welcoming gesture. It was really rather silly, Eleanor thought sternly, and Theodora said, Sorry we weren't here to meet you, we've been exploring. A sour old beldam with a face of curds welcomed us, thank you, he said. My name's Luke Sanderson. Theodora giggled. We, she said, are Eleanor and Theodora, two little girls who were planning a picnic down by the brook and got scared home by a rabbit. Is Dr Montague here? He's inside, gloating over his haunted house. They were silent for a minute, wanting to move closer together. And then Theodora said thinly, It doesn't sound so funny, does it? Now it's getting dark. Ladies, welcome. And the great front door opened. Come inside. I am Dr Montague. I had not decided, the doctor said, turning the brandy in his glass, how best to prepare the three of you for Hill House. It seemingly dislikes letting its guests get away. They were in a small parlour, warm and almost sleepy. Eleanor glanced at Theodora and Luke and found both their faces fallen instinctively into a completely wrapped classroom look. You will recall, the doctor began, the houses described in Leviticus as leprous, or Homer's phrase for the underworld, Hadu Domos, the house of Hades. It might not then be too fanciful to say that some houses are born bad. He sighed, relaxing, and gave them a little smile. I first heard about Hill House a year ago from a former tenant. He began by assuring me that he had left Hill House 
because his family objected to living so far out in the country, and ended by saying that, in his opinion, the house ought to be burned down and the ground sowed with salt. I learned of other people who had rented Hill House, and found that none of them had stayed more than a few days. As a result, I went to Mrs. Sanderson, Luke's aunt, and arranged to rent Hill House. She was most frank about its undesirability, but agreed to allow me a short lease to carry out my researches on condition that a member of the family be one of my party. There. Now I have explained how I happen to be here and why Luke has come. As for you two ladies, I hope that each of you might, in her own way, intensify the forces at work in the house. Theodora has shown herself possessed of some telepathic ability, and Eleanor has, in the past, been intimately involved in poltergeist phenomena. I, of course, the doctor looked at her curiously. Many years ago, when you were a child, the stones. Eleanor frowned and shook her head. Her fingers trembled around the stem of her glass, and then she said, "That was the neighbours." My mother said, "The neighbours did that. People are always jealous." Perhaps so. The doctor spoke quietly, and smiled at Eleanor. The incident has been forgotten. Long ago, of course. But what's here? Theodora asked. What really frightens people? I will not put a name to what has no name, the doctor said. I don't know. They never even told me what was going on, Eleanor said urgently to the doctor. My mother said it was the neighbours. They were always against us because she wouldn't mix with them. My mother, Luke, interrupted her slowly and deliberately. I think," he said, "that what we all want is facts, something we can understand and put together. First, the doctor said, "I'm going to ask you all a question: Do you want to leave? Do you advise that we pack up now and leave Hill House to itself?" He looked at Eleanor, and Eleanor put her hands together tight. It is another chance to get away," she was thinking, and she said, "No," and glanced with embarrassment at Theodora. "I was a bit of a baby this afternoon," she explained. "I did let myself get frightened." The doctor laughed. "I, I suppose we're all nervous this afternoon, anyway." "I don't think we could leave now if we wanted to." Eleanor had spoken before she realised clearly what she was going to say, or what it was going to sound like to the others. She saw that they were staring at her, and laughed and added lamely, "Mrs. Dudley would never forgive us." She wondered if they really believed that that was what she had meant to say, and thought, "Perhaps it has us now. This house." Perhaps it will not let us go. Let us have a little more brandy, the doctor said, and I will tell you the story of Hell House. He returned to his classroom position before the fireplace. Hill House was built eighty odd years ago. He began by a man named Hugh Crane, a country home where he hoped to see his children and grandchildren live in comfortable luxury, and where he fully expected to end his days in quiet. Unfortunately, Hill House was a sad house almost from the beginning. Hugh Crane's young wife. Died minutes before she was first to set eyes on the house, when the carriage bringing her here overturned in the driveway. He was a sad and bitter man, Ukraine, left with two small daughters to bring up, but he did not leave Hill House. Children grew up here, Eleanor asked incredulously. I hope they went wading in the brook, Theodora said. 
She stared deeply into the fire. Their father married again, the doctor went on. Twice more, as a matter of fact. He seems to have been unlucky in his wives. The second Mrs. Crane died of a fall, and the third Mrs. Crane died of what they used to call consumption somewhere in Europe. After that, Hugh Crane declared his intention of closing Hell House and remaining abroad, and his daughters were sent to live with a cousin of their mother's, and there they remained until they were grown up. The house was empty for a number of years, but kept always in readiness for the family. At first, an expectation of Hugh Crane's return, and then, after his death, for either of the sisters who chose to live there. Somewhere during this time, it was apparently agreed between the two sisters that Hill House should become the property of the older. The younger sister had married. Aha, Theodora said. The younger sister married. Stole her sister's bow, I've no doubt. The older sister seems to have resembled her father strongly. She lived here alone for a number of years, almost in seclusion. Incredible as it may sound to you, she genuinely loved Hill House and looked upon it as her family home. She eventually took a girl from the village of Hillsdale to live with her as a kind of companion. Old Miss Crane was in constant disagreement with her sister over the house. The younger sister insisting that she had given up her claim in exchange for a number of family heirlooms, some of considerable value, which the older sister then refused to give her. At any rate, the older sister died of pneumonia here in the house, with only the little companion to help her. After the death of the older sister, there was a lawsuit over the house. The companion insisted that the house was left to her. But the younger sister and her husband maintained most violently that the house belonged legally to them. And as in all family quarrels, incredibly harsh and cruel things were said on either side. The companion swore in court, and here I think is the first hint of Hill House in its true personality, that the younger sister came into the house at night and stole things. When she was pressed to enlarge upon this accusation, she became very nervous and incoherent. The companion won her case at last, and the house became legally hers, although the younger sister never gave up trying to get it. She pursued the unfortunate companion with letters and threats and made the wildest accusations against her. The companion went in terror, seemingly. I read one pathetic letter in which she complained that she had not spent a peaceful night in the house since the death of her benefactor. Oddly enough, sympathy around the village was almost entirely with the younger sister, perhaps because the companion, once a village girl, was now lady of the manor. Well, gossip is always a bad enemy. When the poor creature killed herself, Killed herself. Eleanor, shocked into speech, half rose. She had to kill herself. She should have gone away, Eleanor said. Left the house and run as far as she could go. In effect, she did. I really think the poor girl was hated to death. She hanged herself, by the way. Gossip says she hanged herself from the turret on the tower. But when you have a house like Hill House with a tower and a turret, gossip will hardly allow you to hang yourself anywhere else. After her death, the house passed legally into the hands of the Sanderson family, who were cousins of hers, and in no way as vulnerable to the persecutions of the younger sister. The Sandersons spent a few days in the house, telling the villagers that they were preparing it for their immediate occupancy and then abruptly cleared out. It has been on the market for sale or rent ever since. Those two poor little girls, Eleanor said, looking into the fire. And so the old house has just been sitting here. Luke put out a tentative finger and touched a marble cupid gingerly. Nothing in it touched, nothing used, nothing here wanted by anyone anymore. 
just sitting here, thinking. And waiting, Eleanor said. And waiting, the doctor confirmed. Essentially, he went on slowly, the evil is the house itself, I think. It has enchained and destroyed its people and their lives. It is a place of contained ill will. Well, Luke said after a little silence, I'm sure we will all be very comfortable here. Eleanor awakened to find the blue room grey and colourless in the morning rain. It was a surprise to find that she had slept until after eight, and she thought that it was ironic that the first good night's sleep she had had in years had come to her in Hill House. The room came clearly alive around her. She was in the blue room, the dimity curtains were moving slightly at the window, and the wild splashing in the bathroom must be Theodora, awake, sure to be dressed and ready first, certain to be hungry. Good morning, Eleanor called, and Theodora answered, gasping. Good morning. Through in a minute. I'll leave the tub filled for you. Are you starving because I am? Does she think I wouldn't bathe unless she left a full tub for me? I came here to stop thinking things like that, she told herself sternly, and rolled out of bed and went to the window. It's charming, Eleanor thought, surprised at herself. She wondered if she was the first person ever to find Hill House charming, and then thought, chilled, or do they all think so, the first morning? She shivered, and found herself at the same time unable to account for the excitement she felt. I'll starve to death, Theodora pounded on the bathroom door, and Eleanor snatched at her robe and hurried. Try to look like a stray sunbeam, Theodora called out from her room. It's such a dark day, we've got to be a little brighter than usual. Eleanor was thinking that it had been a very long time since she had dressed to look like a stray sunbeam, or been so hungry for breakfast, or arisen so aware, so conscious of herself, so deliberate and tender in her attentions, she even brushed her teeth with a niceness she could not remember ever feeling before. It is all the result of a good night's sleep, she thought. Since Mother died, I must have been sleeping even more poorly than I realised. Aren't you ready yet? Coming, coming, Eleanor said, and ran to the door. Theodora was waiting for her in the hall, vivid in the dullness in gaudy plaid. Do you realise that we may be another hour or so just finding the dining room? Theodora said. But maybe they've left us a map. Did you know that Luke and the Doctor have been up for hours? I was talking to them from the window. They have started without me, Eleanor thought. Tomorrow I will wake up earlier and be there to talk from the window too. They came to the foot of the stairs and Theodora crossed the great dark hall and put her hand confidently to a door. Here, she said. But the door opened into a dim, echoing room neither of them had seen before. Here, Eleanor said, but the door she chose led onto the narrow passage to the little parlour where last night they had sat before a fire. It's across the hall from that, Theodora said and turned baffled. Oh, damn, she said, and shouted, Luke, doctor. Distantly, they heard an answering shout, and Theodora moved to open another door. If they think, she said over her shoulder, that they're going to keep me forever in this filthy hall, trying one door after another to get my breakfast, she shouted again, blundered against some light piece of furniture, cursed, and then the door beyond was opened, and the doctor said, Good morning. Foul, filthy house, Theodora said, rubbing her knee. Good morning. You'll never believe this now, of course, the doctor said. But three minutes ago, these doors were wide open. We left them open so you could find your way. We sat here and watched them swing shut 
just before you called. They had come through the darkness of one night. They had met morning in Hill House, and they were a family, greeting one another with easy informality and going to the chairs they had used last night at dinner, their own places at the table. Did you really leave all the doors open for us? Eleanor asked. That's how we knew you were coming, Luke told her. We saw all the doors swing shut. Today we will nail all the doors open, Theodora said. I am going to pace this house until I can find food ten times out of ten. They began reasonably enough with the dining room door, which they propped open with a heavy chair. The room beyond was the games room. The table against which Theodora had stumbled was a low inlaid chess table. Jolly spot to spend a carefree hour. Luke said, standing in the doorway, regarding the bleak room. Over the mantel, a deer head looked down upon them in patent embarrassment. This is where they came to enjoy themselves, Theodora said. Those two little girls. Can we please take down that beast up there? I think it's taken a fancy to you, Luke said. It's never taken its eyes off you since you came in. Let's get out of here. They propped the door open as they left, and came out into the hall, which shone dully under the light from the open rooms. When we find a room with a window, the doctor remarked, we will open it. Until then, let us be content with opening the front door. You keep thinking of the little children, Eleanor said to Theodora. But I can't forget that lonely little companion, walking around these rooms, wondering who else was in the house. Luke tugged the great front door open and wheeled the big vase to hold it. Fresh air, he said thankfully. Then the doctor said, "Now here is something none of you anticipated." He opened a small door tucked in beside the tall front door. And stood back, smiling. The library, he said, in the tower. I can't go in there, Eleanor said, surprising herself. But she could not. She backed away, overwhelmed with the cold air of mould and earth, which rushed at her. My mother, she said, not knowing what she wanted to tell them. And pressed herself against the wall. Coming, mother, coming, Eleanor said, fumbling for the light. It's all right. I'm coming. Eleanor, she heard. Eleanor, coming, coming, she shouted irritably. Just a minute, I'm coming. Eleanor. Then she thought, with a crashing shock which brought her awake, cold and shivering, out of bed and awake. I am in Hill House. What? She cried out. What, Theodora? Eleanor, in here. Coming. No time for the light. She kicked a table out of the way, wondering at the noise of it, and struggled briefly with the door of the connecting bathroom. I'm here. What is it? She sat down slowly on the foot of Theodora's bed, wondering at what seemed calmness in herself. It is only a noise, she thought. And terribly cold, terribly, terribly cold. It is a noise down the hall, far down at the end, near the nursery door, and terribly cold. Not my mother, knocking on the wall. Something is knocking on the doors, Theodora said in a tone of pure rationality. Just a noise. 
It sounded, Eleanor thought, like a hollow noise, a hollow bang, as though something were hitting the doors with an iron kettle or an iron bar or an iron glove. It seemed to be going methodically from door to door at the end of the hall, and Eleanor thought that the oddest part of this indescribable experience was that Theodora should be having it too. It struck against the door next to them, and Eleanor threw herself away from the bed and ran to hold her hands against the door. "Go away!" she shouted wildly. "Go away!" There was complete silence, and Eleanor thought, standing with her face against the door, "Now I've done it." It was looking for the room with someone inside. The cold crept and pinched at them, filling and overflowing the room. I'm cold," Theodora said, "deadly cold." So am I. Eleanor took the green quilt and threw it around Theodora, and took up Theodora's warm dressing gown and put it on. You warmer now? Where's Luke? Where's the doctor? I don't know. Are you warmer now? No," Theodora shivered. It started again, so suddenly that Eleanor leaped back against the bed, and Theodora gasped and cried out. The iron crash came against their door. It had found them. Little patting came from around the door frame, small seeking sounds, feeling the edges of the door. You can't get in," Eleanor said wildly. And again there was a silence, as though the house listened with attention to her words. Understanding, cynically agreeing, content to wait. A thin little giggle came. In a breath of air through the room, a little mad rising laugh, the smallest whisper of a laugh, and Eleanor heard it all up and down her back. A little gloating laugh moving past them around the house. And then she heard the doctor and Luke. Calling from the stairs, and mercifully, it was over. When the real silence came, Eleanor breathed shakily and moved stiffly. We've been clutching each other like a couple of lost children, Theodora said, and untwined her arms from around Eleanor's neck. You're wearing my bathrobe. I forgot mine. Is it really over? For tonight, anyway, Theodora spoke with certainty. Here come Luke and the doctor. Why, you look as though you've both seen a ghost," said Luke. Did、uh, anything happen in here while we were outside? The doctor asked. Eleanor and Theodora looked at each other, and laughed, honestly at last, without any edge of hysteria or fear. Looking at herself in the mirror, with the bright morning sunlight freshening even the blue room of Hill House, Eleanor thought, "It is my second morning in Hill House, and I am unbelievably happy. I have been frightened half out of my foolish wits, but I have somehow earned this joy. I have been waiting for it for so long." Eleanor. Now Theodora pounded on the connecting door. "Are you awake? May I come in?" "Of course," Eleanor said, looking at her own face in the mirror. "You deserve it," she told herself. "You have spent your life earning it." Theodora opened the door and said happily, "How pretty you look this morning, my Nell. This curious life agrees with you." Eleanor smiled at her. The life clearly agreed with Theodora too. Laughing, they raced down the great staircase and found their way into the dining room. Good morning, Luke said brightly. And how did everyone sleep? Delightfully, thank you, Eleanor said, like a baby. There may have been a little noise, Theodora said, but one has to expect that in these old houses. Doctor. What do we do this morning?、Hmm? Said the doctor, looking up. 
He alone looked tired, but his eyes were lighted with the same brightness. It is excitement, Eleanor thought. We are all enjoying ourselves. The doctor frowned. This excitement troubles me, he said. It is intoxicating, certainly, but might it not also be dangerous? An effect of the atmosphere of Hill House. The first sign that we have, as it were, fallen under a spell. And yet, Luke said, if last night is a true measure of Hill House, we're not going to have much trouble. We were frightened, certainly, and found the experience unpleasant while it was going on, and yet I cannot remember that I felt in any physical danger. No physical danger exists, the doctor said positively. The only damage done is by the victim to himself. The mind, the conscious thinking mind, is invulnerable. Not one of us thinks rationally that what knocked on the door was a ghost, and yet there was certainly something going on in Hill House last night. And the mind's instinctive refuge, self-doubt, is eliminated. We cannot say, it was my imagination, because three other people were there too. I could say, Eleanor put in, smiling, all three of you are in my imagination. None of this is real. If I thought you could really believe that, the doctor said gravely, I will turn you out of Hill House this morning. You would be venturing far too close to the state of mind which would welcome the perils of Hill House with a kind of sisterly embrace. Well, Eleanor said, if I had to take sides with Hill House against the rest of you, I would expect you to send me away. Why me? she wondered. Why me? Am I the public conscience? Expected always to say in cold words what the rest of them are too arrogant to recognize. Am I supposed to be the weakest? Weaker than Theodora? Of all of us, she thought. I am surely the one least likely to turn against the others. She shut her eyes quickly and then said demurely to the doctor, And what do we do today? You're still like a pack of children, the doctor said, smiling too, always asking me what to do today. Can't you amuse yourself with your toys or with each other? I have work to do. All I really want to do, and Theodora giggled, is slide down that banister. The excited gaiety had caught her as it had Eleanor. Hide and seek, Luke said. It's ten o'clock. I clear. Good morning, Mrs. Dudley, the doctor said. And Eleanor and Theodora and Luke leaned back and laughed helplessly. I clear at ten o'clock. Mrs. Dudley, the doctor began sternly, and then, noticing Luke's face tight with silent laughter, lifted his napkin to cover his eyes and gave in. You, you may, uh, clear the table, Mrs. Dudley, the doctor said brokenly. Happily, the sound of their laughter echoing along the halls of Hill House, they made their way down the passage to their parlour and fell, still laughing, into chairs. They laughed for a long time, speaking now and then in half phrases, trying to tell one another something, pointing at one another wildly, and their laughter rocked Hill House until, weak and aching, they lay back, spent, and regarded one another. Now, the doctor began, and they were quiet. I want more coffee, he said, appealing. Don't we all? You mean go right in there and ask Mrs. Dudley? Eleanor asked. Walk right up to her when it isn't one o'clock or six o'clock and just ask her for some coffee? Theodora demanded. Uh, roughly, yes, the doctor said. Luke, my boy, I have observed that you are already something of a favourite with Mrs. Dudley. And how? Luke inquired with amazement. 
Did you ever manage to observe anything so unlikely? Mrs. Dudley regards me with the same particular loathing she gives a dish not properly on its shelf. Nonsense, the doctor said heartily. Do not be surprised, Luke said, and I say it darkly. Do not be surprised if you lose your Luke in this cause, if I do not return. And he shook his finger warningly under the doctor's nose, bowing extravagantly, as befitted one off to slay a giant. He closed the door behind him. Lovely Luke. Theodora stretched luxuriously. Lovely hill house, Eleanor said. Can we explore it this morning? We'll ask Luke to come too. And you, Doctor? My notes, the Doctor began, and then stopped, as the door opened so suddenly that in Eleanor's mind was only the thought that Luke had not dared face Mrs. Dudley after all, but had stood waiting, pressed against the door. Then, looking at his white face, she found herself only asking urgently, Luke? It's all right. Luke even smiled. But come into the long hallway. Chilled by his face and his voice and his smile, they got up silently and followed him through the doorway, into the dark long hallway which led back to the front hall. Here, Luke said. It's writing, Eleanor asked, pressing closer to see. The doctor took his flashlight from his pocket, and under its light, as he moved slowly from one end of the hall to the other, the letters stood out clearly. Chalk, the doctor said, stepping forward to touch a letter with the top of his finger. Uh, written in chalk. Can you read it? Luke asked softly. And the doctor, moving his flashlight, read slowly, Help, Eleanor, come home. lazily at Hill House. Eleanor and Theodora, the Doctor and Luke, alert against terror, wrapped around by the rich hills and securely set into the warm, dark luxuries of the house, were permitted a quiet day and a quiet night, enough, perhaps, to dull them a little. It had become Eleanor's habit to hesitate in the doorway of her room, glancing around quickly before she went inside. She told herself that this was because the room was so exceedingly blue and always took a moment to get used to. When she came inside, she went across to open the window, which she always found closed. Today, she was halfway across the room before she heard Theodora's door slam back and Theodora smothered, Eleanor! Moving quickly, Eleanor ran into the hall and to Theodora's doorway to stop aghast, looking over Theodora's shoulder. What is it? she whispered. What does it look like? Theodora's voice rose crazily. What does it look like, you fool? I won't forgive her for that, Eleanor thought concretely through her bewilderment. It looks like paint, she said, hesitantly, except except the smell is awful. It's blood, Theodora said with finality. She clung to the door, swaying as the door moved, staring. Blood, she said, all over. Do you see it? Of course I see it, and it's not all over. Stop making such a fuss. And then, cold, she asked, Is that more writing on the wall? and heard Theodora's wild laugh and thought, I must be steady, and she closed her eyes. Yes, indeed, dear, Theodora said. I don't know how you managed it. 
Be sensible, Eleanor said. Call Luke and the doctor. Why? Theodora asked. Wasn't it to be just a little private surprise for me? A secret just for the two of us? Then, pulling away from Eleanor, she ran to the great wardrobe and threw open the door. My clothes, she said. Steadily, Eleanor turned and went to the top of the stairs. Luke, she called, leaning over the banisters. Doctor! She heard the doctor's book dropped to the floor and then the pounding of feet as he and Luke ran for the stairs. She watched them, seeing their apprehensive faces, wondering at the uneasiness which lay so close below the surface in all of them. It's Theo, she said, as they came to the top of the stairs. She's hysterical. Someone, something, has got red paint in her room and she's crying over her clothes. Now I could not have put it more fairly than that she thought, turning to follow them. Theodora was still sobbing wildly in her room and kicking at the wardrobe door. Her clothes had been torn from the hangers and lay trampled and disordered on the wardrobe floor. What is it? Luke asked the doctor. And the doctor, shaking his head, said, I would swear that it was blood, and yet to get so much blood one would almost have to and then was abruptly quiet. All of them stood in silence for a moment and looked at Help Eleanor Come Home Eleanor written in shaky red letters on the wallpaper over Theodora's bed. The smell was atrocious and the writing on the wall had dripped and splattered. It's disgusting, Eleanor said. Please get Theo into my room. Luke and the doctor between them persuaded Theodora through the bathroom and into Eleanor's room. And Eleanor, looking at the red paint, it must be paint, she told herself. It's simply got to be paint. What else could it be? Said aloud. But why? And stared up at the writing on the wall. Is she all right? She asked turning as the doctor came back into the room. She will be in a few minutes. We'll have to move her in with you for a while, I should think. I can't imagine her wanting to sleep in here again. The doctor smiled a little wanly. I suppose she'll have to wear my clothes. I suppose she will, if you don't mind. The doctor looked at her curiously. This message troubles you less than the other. It's too silly, Eleanor said, trying to understand her own feelings. I've been standing here, looking at it, and just wondering why. I mean, it's like a joke that didn't come off. It's simply too horrible to be real. She giggled, and the doctor looked at her sharply, but she went on. It might as well be paint, don't you see? Maybe I can't take it seriously after the sight of Thea screaming over her poor clothes and accusing me of writing my name all over her wall. Maybe I'm getting used to her, blaming me for everything. Nobody's blaming you for anything, the doctor said, and Eleanor felt that she had been reproved. In the afternoon of the day that Dr. Montague's wife was expected, Eleanor went alone into the hills above Hill House, not really intending to arrive at any place in particular, wanting only to be secret and out from under the heavy dark wood of the house. Idly, she picked a wild daisy, which died in her fingers, and lying on the grass, she looked up into its dead face. There was nothing in her mind beyond an overwhelming wild happiness. She pulled at the daisy and wondered, smiling to herself, What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Dr. Montague hurried into the hallway and kissed his wife obediently on the cheek she held out for him. My dear, my dear, how nice that you got here. We'd given you up. I said I'd be here today, didn't I? 
Did you ever know me not to come when I said I would? I brought Arthur. Arthur, the doctor said without enthusiasm. Well, somebody had to drive, Mrs. Montague said. The doctor turned, smiling on Eleanor and Theodora, with Luke behind them, clustered uncertainly in the doorway. My dear, he said, Th these are my friends who've been staying in Hill House with me these past few days. Theodora, Eleanor Vance, Luke Sanderson. Theodora and Eleanor and Luke murmured civilly. I'm sure I will get to know all your names very soon. This gentleman is Arthur Parker. I am to be in your most haunted room, of course, she went on. Arthur can go anywhere. The nursery, I think, Dr Montague said, when Luke looked at him inquiringly. I believe the nursery is one source of disturbance, he told his wife, and she sighed irritably. It does seem to me, John, that you could be more methodical. You've been here nearly a week, and I suppose you've done nothing with planchette, automatic writing? After nearly a week, I certainly thought you'd have things in some kind of order. There have been decided manifestations. Well, I'm here now, and we'll get things going. I must say, John, I never expected to find you all so nervous, Mrs Montague continued. I deplore fear in these matters. She tapped her foot irritably. You know perfectly well, John, that those who have passed beyond expect to see us happy and smiling. They want to know that we are thinking of them lovingly. The spirits dwelling in this house may be actually suffering because they are aware that you are afraid of them. We can talk about it later, the doctor said wearily. Now, how about dinner? Planchette has been very kind tonight, Mrs. Montague said. John, there are definitely foreign elements present in this house. Quite a splendid sitting, really, Arthur said. He waved a sheaf of paper triumphantly. We've got a good deal of information for you, Mrs. Montague said. Now, Planchette was quite insistent about a nun. Have you learned anything about a nun, John? The figure of a nun is fairly common. John, if you please. I assume you are suggesting that I am mistaken. Or perhaps it is your intention to point out that Planchette may be mistaken. I hardly think, the doctor began. I dare say she was walled up alive, Mrs Montague said. The nun, I mean. They always did that, you know. You've no idea the messages I've had from nuns walled up alive. There is no case on record of any nun ever being... John, may I point out to you once more that I myself have had messages from nuns walled up alive. Do you think I am telling you a fib, John? Or do you suppose that a nun would deliberately pretend to have been walled up alive when she was not? Dear me, how patient one must be sometimes, Mrs Montague sighed. But I do want to read you the little passage we received towards the end. Arthur, do you have it? Arthur shuffled through his sheaf of papers, and Mrs Montague selected several pages, turning them over quickly. Here, she said. Arthur, you read the questions, and I'll read the answers. That way it will sound more natural. Off we go, Arthur said brightly, and leaned over Mrs Montague's shoulder. Now, let me see. Uh, start right about uh, here. With... Who are you? Righto. Who are you? Nell, Mrs Montague read in her sharp voice, and Eleanor and Theodora and Luke and the doctor turned, listening. Nell who? Eleanor, Nellie, Nell, Nell. Spirits sometimes do that, Mrs Montague broke off to explain. They repeat a word over and over to make sure it comes across all right. Arthur cleared his throat. <clears throat> what do you want? He read. Home. Do you want to go home? Want to be home. What are you doing here? Waiting. Waiting for what? Home. Is Hill House your home? Arthur read, levelly. Home, Mrs Montague responded, and the doctor sighed. Are you suffering? 
Arthur read. No answer here, Mrs. Montague nodded reassuringly. Sometimes they dislike admitting to pain. It tends to discourage those of us left behind, you know. What do you want? Arthur read. Mother, Mrs. Montague read back. Why? Child. Where is your mother? Home. Where is your home? Lost, lost, lost. And after that, Mrs. Montague said, folding the paper briskly, there was nothing but gibberish. Never known Planchette so cooperative, Arthur said confidingly to Theodora. Quite an experience, really. But why pick on Nell? Theodora asked with annoyance. Your fool Planchette has no right to send messages to people without permission. They are all carefully avoiding looking at me, Eleanor thought. I have been singled out again. Why do you think all that was sent to me? She asked, helpless. Oh, really, child, Mrs. Montague said, dropping the papers on the low table. I couldn't begin to say. Peace. Eleanor thought concretely. What I want in all this world is peace. A quiet spot to lie and think. A quiet spot up among the flowers where I can dream and tell myself sweet stories. Mrs. Montague, followed by Arthur, moved purposefully down the hall and opened the nursery door. She nodded and said, The bed looks quite fresh, I must admit, but has the room been aired? It smells musty. The doctor hesitated. I wonder if you uh, ought to have someone in here with you, he said. My dear, Mrs. Montague was amused. How many hours, how many, many hours have I sat in purest love and understanding, alone in a room and yet never alone? I am here to help these unfortunate beings. I am here to extend the hand of heartfelt fondness and let them know that there are still some who remember, who will listen and weep for them. Their loneliness is over and I... Yes, the doctor said but leave the door open. Mrs. Montague laughed and waved her hand at him. These others need your protection so much more than I, she said. Arthur returned from checking the other bedrooms on the floor and nodded briskly at the doctor. All clear, he said. Perfectly safe for you to go to bed now. Thank you, the doctor told him soberly and then said to his wife, Good night. Be careful. Good night, Mrs. Montague said, and smiled around at all of them. Please don't be afraid. No matter what happens, remember that I am here. Wait, Theodora said to Eleanor once in their room. Luke said they want us down the hall. She opened the door a crack and whispered over her shoulder. I swear that old biddy's going to blow this house wide open with that perfect love business. If I ever saw a place that had no use for perfect love, it's Hill House. Now, quick, be quiet. Silently, making no sound on the hall carpeting, they hurried down the hall to the doctor's room. Hurry, the doctor said, opening the door just wide enough for them to come in. I don't like it, he said, worried. Something's going to happen. I just hope she didn't go and make anything mad with her planchette, Theodora said. Sorry, Dr. Montague, I didn't intend to speak rudely of your wife. The doctor laughed, but stayed with his eye to the door. She is an excellent woman in most respects. Perhaps she feels she is helping you with your work, Eleanor said. The doctor grimaced and shivered. At that moment... The door swung wide and then crashed shut, and in the silence outside, 
They could hear slow rushing movements as though a very steady, very strong wind were blowing the length of the hall. Glancing at one another, they tried to smile, tried to look courageous under the slow coming of the unreal cold, and then, through the noise of wind, the knocking on the doors downstairs. Eleanor, clinging to Theodora, thought, It knows my name. It knows my name this time. The pounding came up the stairs, crashing on each step. The doctor was tense, standing by the door, and Luke moved over to stand beside him. It's nowhere near the nursery, he said to the doctor, and put his hand out to stop the doctor from opening the door. How weary one gets of this constant pounding, Theodora said ridiculously. Next summer I must really go somewhere else. There are disadvantages everywhere, Luke told her. By water, you get mosquitoes. Could we have exhausted the repertoire of Hill House? Theodora asked, her voice shaking in spite of her light tone. Seems like we've had this pounding act before. Eleanor, rocking to the pounding, which seemed inside her head as much as in the hall, holding tight to Theodora, said, They know where we are. And the others, assuming that she meant Arthur and Mrs. Montague, nodded and listened. It never hurt us, Theodora was telling the doctor, across the noise of the pounding. It won't hurt them. I only hope she doesn't try to do anything about it, the doctor said grimly. Then there came, suddenly, quiet. Holding their breaths, they looked at one another. The doctor held the doorknob with both hands, and Luke, although his face was white and his voice trembled, said lightly, Brandy? Anyone? Using both hands to carry the glass, he came to the bed where Theodora and Eleanor huddled under the blanket, and Theodora brought out one hand and took the glass. Here, she said, holding it to Eleanor's mouth. Drink. Sipping. Not warmed, Eleanor thought, We are in the eye of the storm. There is not much more time. She watched Luke carefully carry a glass of brandy over to the doctor and hold it out, and then, without comprehending, watched the glass slip through Luke's fingers to the floor as the door was shaken violently and silently. Luke pulled the doctor back, and the door was attacked without sound, seeming almost to be pulling away from its hinges, almost ready to buckle and go down, leaving them exposed. It knows we're here, Eleanor whispered, and Luke, looking back at her over his shoulder, gestured furiously for her to be quiet. Now we're going to have a new noise, Eleanor thought, listening to the inside of her head. It is changing. There was now a swift movement up and down the hall, as of an animal pacing back and forth with unbelievable impatience, and there was again the little babbling murmur which Eleanor remembered. Am I doing it? she wondered quickly. Is that me? And she heard the tiny laughter beyond the door, mocking her. It's inside my head, Eleanor thought, putting her hands over her face. I am disappearing inch by inch into this house. I am going apart a little bit at a time, because all this noise is breaking me. It's inside my head, and it's getting out, getting out. Now the house shivered and shook, the curtains dashing against the windows, the furniture swaying, and the noise in the hall became so great that it pushed against the walls. They could hear breaking glass as the pictures in the hall came down, and perhaps the smashing of windows. Luke and the doctor strained against the door as though desperately holding it shut, and the floor moved under their feet. Holding to the bed, buffeted and shaken, Eleanor put her head down and closed her eyes and bit her lips against the cold and felt the sickening drop as the room fell away beneath her. In the churning darkness where Eleanor fell endlessly, nothing was real except her own hands white around the bedpost. 
Somewhere, there was a great shaking crash as some huge thing came headlong. It must be the tower, Eleanor thought. And I supposed it would stand for years. We are lost, lost. The house is destroying itself. She heard the laughter, coming thin and lunatic, rising in its little crazy tune, and she thought, No, it is over for me. It is too much, she thought. I will relinquish my possession of this self of mine. Abdicate. Give over willingly what I never wanted at all. Whatever it wants of me, it can have. I'll come, she said aloud, and was speaking up to Theodora, who leaned over her. The room was perfectly quiet, and between the still curtains at the window, she could see the sunlight. Luke sat in a chair by the window. His face was bruised, and his shirt was torn, and he was still drinking brandy. The doctor sat back in another chair, looking neat and dapper and self-possessed. How? Eleanor said, and all three of them laughed. Another day, the doctor said, and in spite of his appearance, his voice was wan. Another night, he said. How are they? Eleanor asked, the words sounding unfamiliar and her mouth stiff. Both sleeping like babies, the doctor said. What happened? Eleanor asked. Hill House went dancing, Theodora said, taking us along in a mad midnight fling. At least, I think it was dancing. It might have been turning somersaults. It's almost nine, the doctor said. When Eleanor is ready... Come along, baby, Theodora said. Theo will wash your face for you and make you all neat for breakfast. Did anyone tell them that Mrs Dudley clears at ten? Theodora looked into the coffee pot speculatively. The doctor hesitated. I hate to wake them after such a night. They're coming, Eleanor said. I can hear them on the stairs. I can hear everything all over the house. She wanted to tell them. Then, distantly, they could all hear Mrs. Montague's voice raised in irritation. Properly aired. Mrs. Montague's voice preceded her and she swept into the dining room, tapped the doctor curtly on the shoulder by way of a greeting and seated herself with a general nod to the others. I must say, she began at once, that I think you might have called us for breakfast. Theodora almost upset the coffee pot in her haste to set a cup of coffee before Mrs. Montague. I shall speak to your Mrs. Dudley this morning in any case, Mrs. Montague said. That room must be aired. And your night? the doctor asked timidly. In answer to your most civil inquiry, I did not spend a comfortable night. I did not sleep a wink. That room is unendurable. Noisy old house, isn't it? Arthur said. Branch kept tapping against my window all night. Can't understand you, he continued to the doctor, letting herself get all nervy about this place. Sat there all night long with my revolver, and not a mouse stirred. Theo? Eleanor put down her notepad, and Theodora, scribbling busily, looked up with a frown. I've been thinking about something. I hate writing these notes. I feel like a damn fool trying to write this crazy stuff. I've been wondering. Well? Theodora smiled a little. You look so serious, she said. Are you coming to some great decision? Yes, Eleanor said, deciding. About what I'm going to do afterwards. After we all leave Hill House. Well... I'm coming with you, Eleanor said. Coming where with me? Back with you. Back home. I'm not in the habit of taking home stray cats, 
Theodora said lightly. Eleanor laughed too. I am a kind of stray cat, aren't I? Theodora took up her pencil again. You have your own home, she said. You'll be glad enough to get back to it when the time comes, Nell, my Nelly. I'll come, you know, Eleanor said. I'll just come. Nelly, Nelly, Theodora laughed again. Look, she said, this is just a summer. Just a few weeks' visit to a lovely old summer resort in the country. You have your life back home. I have my life. I can get a job. I won't be in your way. I don't understand. Theodora threw down her pencil in exasperation. Do you always go where you're not wanted? Eleanor smiled placidly. I've never been wanted anywhere, she said. Journeys end in lovers meeting, Luke said, and smiled across the room at Eleanor. Theodora leaned her head against the back of her chair and closed her eyes. Eleanor sat, looking down at her hands, and listened to the sounds of the house. Somewhere upstairs, a door swung quietly shut. In the kitchen, the stove was settling and cooling with little soft creakings. She could even hear, with her new awareness of the house, the dust drifting gently in the attics, the wood aging. Only the library was closed to her. She could not hear the heavy breathing of Mrs. Montague and Arthur over their planchette, nor their little excited questions. She could not hear the books rotting, or rust seeping into the circular iron stairway to the tower. She heard when the library door slammed open, and then the sharp, angry sound of footsteps coming to the little parlour, and then all of them turned as Mrs. Montague opened the door and marched in. I must say, said Mrs. Montague, I really must say, all I ask, all I ask, is some small minimum of trust, just a little bit of sympathy for all I am trying to do, and instead you disbelieve, you scoff, you mock, and jeer. Breathing heavily, red faced, she shook her finger at the doctor. Planchette, she said bitterly, will not speak to me tonight. My dear, the doctor said, I am certain that none of us would knowingly have interfered. Mocking and jeering, were you not? Those young people, pert and insolent? Mrs. Montague, really, said Luke. But Mrs. Montague brushed past him and sat herself down, her lips tight and her eyes blazing. The doctor sighed, started to speak, and then stopped. Turning away from his wife, he gestured Luke to the chess table. Apprehensively, Luke followed. Eleanor was hardly listening, wondering dimly at the movement in the room. Someone was walking around. She thought without interest. Luke was walking back and forth in the room, talking softly to himself. Surely an odd way to play chess, humming, singing. Once or twice, she almost made out a broken word, and then Luke spoke quietly. He was at the chess table where he belonged, and Eleanor turned and looked at the empty centre of the room, where someone. Was walking and singing softly, and then she heard it clearly. Go in and out the windows. Go in and out the windows. Go in and out the windows, as we have done before. Why I know that, she thought, listening, smiling to the faint melody. We used to play that game. I remember that. The voice was light, perhaps only a child's voice, singing sweetly and thinly on the barest breath. And Eleanor smiled and remembered. Go forth and face your lover. 
go forth and face your lover, go forth and face your lover, as we have done before. She heard the little melody fade, and felt the slightest movement of air as the footsteps came close to her, and something almost brushed her face. Perhaps there was a tiny sigh against her cheek, and she turned in surprise. Luke and the doctor bent over the chessboard. Arthur leaned confidingly close to Theodora, and Mrs. Montague talked. None of them heard it, she thought with joy. Nobody heard it but me. Eleanor closed the bedroom door softly behind her, not wanting to awaken Theodora. The hall was dim, lighted only by a small nightlight over the stairs, and all the doors were closed. Eleanor had awakened with the thought of going down to the library, and her mind had supplied her with a reason. I cannot sleep, she explained to herself, and so I am going downstairs to get a book. It was warm, drowsily, luxuriously warm. She went barefoot. And in silence, down the great staircase, and to the library door, before she thought, "But I can't go in there. I'm not allowed in there." And recoiled in the doorway before the odor of decay, which nauseated her. "Mother," she said aloud, and stepped quickly back. "Come along," a voice answered distinctly upstairs, and Eleanor turned, eager, and hurried to the staircase. You're here somewhere," she said, and down the hall the little echo went. "Somewhere," it said, "somewhere." Laughing, Eleanor followed, running soundlessly down the hall to the nursery doorway. "Are you in here?" she whispered outside the door and knocked, pounding with her fists. "Yes." It was Mrs. Montague inside, clearly just awakened. "Yes." Come in, whatever you are. No, no, Eleanor thought, hugging herself and laughing silently. Not in there. Dancing, the carpet soft under her feet, she came to the door behind which Theodora slept. Faithless Theo, she thought. Cruel, laughing Theo, wake up, wake up, wake up, and pounded and slapped the door, laughing, and then ran swiftly down the hall to Luke's door and pounded. Wake up," she thought. "Wake up and be faithless." Wake up, pounding on the doctor's door. I dare you to open your door and come out to see me, dancing in the hall of Hill House. Then Theodora startled her by calling out wildly. "No, no, doctor, Luke, Nell's not here." Poor house," Eleanor thought. "I had forgotten Eleanor. Now they will have to open their doors." And she ran quickly down the stairs, hearing behind her the doctor's voice raised anxiously, and Theodora calling, "Nell, Eleanor." What fools they are," she thought. "Now I will have to go into the library." She ran down the corridor again and peeked out at them from a doorway. They were moving purposefully, all together, straining to stay near one another. And the doctor's flashlight swept the hall and stopped at the great front door, which was standing open wide. Then, in a rush, calling Eleanor, Eleanor, they ran all together across the hall and out the front door. The flashlight moving busily. Eleanor clung to the door. And laughed until tears came into her eyes. What fools they are! She thought. We tricked them so easily. When they came back into the front hall, blundering and calling her, she darted quickly out onto the veranda, into the cool night. Eleanor. They were very close, and she ran along the veranda and darted into the drawing room. Go in and out the windows," she sang, and felt her hands taken as she danced out onto the veranda and around the house. 
Here I am, she said aloud. I've been all around the house, in and out the windows, and I danced. Eleanor. It was Luke's voice, and she thought, oh, of all of them, I would least like to have Luke catch me. Don't let him see me, she thought, beggingly, and turned and ran without stopping into the library. And here I am, she thought. Here I am inside. It was not cold at all, but deliciously, fondly warm. It was light enough for her to see the iron stairway curving around and around up to the tower, and the little door at the top. Under her feet, the stone floor moved caressingly, rubbing itself against the soles of her feet, and all around, the soft air touched her, stirring her hair, drifting against her fingers, and she danced in circles. I have broken the spell of Hill House, and somehow come inside. I am home, she thought, and stopped in wonder at the thought. I am home. I am home. Now to climb. Climbing the narrow iron stairway was intoxicating. Going higher and higher, around and around, looking down, clinging to the slim iron railing, looking far, far down onto the stone floor. Eleanor. For a minute. She could not remember who they were, and she hesitated, clinging to the railing. They were so small, so ineffectual. Luke, she said, remembering. Doctor Montague, Mrs. Montague, Arthur. She could not remember the other, who stood silent and a little apart. What on earth is the creature doing? Mrs. Montague demanded. Arthur, make her come down at once. See here, Arthur began, and Luke moved to the foot of the stairway and started up. For God's sake, be careful! The doctor said. The thing is rotted away from the wall. Eleanor, can you turn around and start down slowly? Above her was only the little trap door leading out onto the turret. Futilely, she hammered against it with her fists, thinking wildly, "Make it open! Make it open! Or they'll catch me!" Glancing over her shoulder, she could see Luke climbing steadily. "Eleanor," he said, "stand still. Don't move." And he sounded frightened. "I can't get away," she thought, and looked down. She saw one face clearly, and the name came into her mind. Theodora, she said. No, do as they tell you, please. Why? Eleanor looked down, and saw the dizzy fall of the tower below her, the iron stairway clinging to the tower walls, shaking and straining under Luke's feet, the distant, pale, staring faces. How can I get down? She asked helplessly. Doctor, how can I get down? Move very slowly, he said. Do what Luke tells you. Hold on, Nell. I'm coming onto the platform. Luke's hand trembled as he reached out to take hold of the railing, and his face was wet. Come on, he said sharply. Get past me. And start down the stairs. Meekly, she came along the platform, and pressed herself against the hard stone wall, while Luke moved cautiously past her. Start down, he said. I'll be right behind you. Precariously, the iron stairway shaking and groaning with every step, she felt her way. Only a little farther, the doctor said. Creeping. Eleanor slid her feet down, one step after another, and at last, almost before she could believe it, stepped off onto the stone floor. Behind her, the stairway rocked and clanged as Luke leaped down the last few steps and walked steadily across the room to fall against a chair and stop.
trembling still. Eleanor turned and looked surprised down at her own bare feet, realizing suddenly that they had carried her unfeeling down the iron stairway. She raised her head. I came down to the library to get a book. It was humiliating, disastrous. Nothing was said at breakfast, and Eleanor was served coffee and eggs and rolls just like the others. She was allowed to linger over her coffee with the rest of them, observe the sunlight outside, comment upon the good day ahead. For a few minutes, she might have been persuaded to believe that nothing had happened. Then, after breakfast, after Mrs. Dudley's entrance at ten. They came without comment, following one another silently, to the little parlour, and the doctor took his position before the fireplace. Theodora was wearing Eleanor's red sweater. Luke,、uh, we'll bring your car around, the doctor said gently. Theodora will go up and pack for you. Eleanor giggled. She can't. She won't have anything to wear. Now, Theodora began, and stopped, and glanced at Mrs. Montague, who shrugged her shoulders and said, "I examined the room. Naturally, I can't imagine why none of you thought to do it." Theodora's room, Luke asked. I wouldn't like to go in there again. Mrs. Montague sounded surprised. I can't think why not, she said. There's nothing wrong with it. I went in and looked at my clothes," Theodora said to the doctor. "They're perfectly fine." Eleanor laughed. "But I can't leave," she said, wondering where to find words to explain. "You have been here quite long enough," the doctor said. Theodora stared at her. "I don't need your clothes," she said patiently. "Now." You've got to go away from here. <laughs> but but I can't leave," Eleanor said, laughing still because it was so perfectly impossible to explain. Perhaps Arthur had better drive her back to the city. Arthur could see that she gets there safely. Gets where? Eleanor shook her head at them, feeling her lovely heavy hair around her face. Gets where? She asked happily. Why, the doctor said, home, of course. And Theodora said, "Well, your own little place, your own apartment, where all your things are." And Eleanor laughed. <laughs> "I, I haven't any apartment," she said to Theodora. "I made it up. I sleep on a camp bed at my sister's in the baby's room." And I can't go back to my sister's because I stole her car. She laughed, hearing her own words, so inadequate and so unutterably sad. I haven't any home, and regarded them hopefully. No home. Everything in all the world that belongs to me is in a carton in the back of my car. That's all I have. Some books and things I had when I was a little girl, and. A watch my mother gave me. So you see, there's no place you can send me. I want to stay here. I have already spoken to the sister, Mrs. Montague said importantly. I must say she asked first about the car. A vulgar person. I told her she need have no fear. You were very wrong, John, to let her steal her sister's car and come here. At any rate, she is expected. The sister was most annoyed at me because they'd planned to go off on their holiday today. Although why she should be annoyed at me, Mrs. Montague scowled at Eleanor. I do think someone ought to see her safely into their hands. The doctor shook his head. 
It would be a mistake, he said slowly. It would be a mistake to send one of us with her. She must be allowed to forget everything about this house as soon as she can. We cannot prolong the association. Once away from here, she will be herself again. Can you find your way home? He asked Eleanor, and Eleanor laughed. I want to stay here, she said. They made a solid line along the steps of Hill House, guarding the door. Beyond their heads, she could see the windows looking down, and to one side the tower waited confidently. She might have cried if she could have thought of any way of telling them why. The house was waiting now, she thought, and it was waiting for her. No one else could satisfy it. The house wants me to stay, she told the doctor, and he stared at her. His back was squarely turned to the house, and, looking at him honestly, she said, I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry, really. You'll go to Hillsdale, he said, levelly. Perhaps he was afraid of saying too much. Perhaps he thought that a kind word or a sympathetic one might rebound upon himself and bring her back. In Hillsdale, turn on to the motorway at exit five, going east. At Ashton, you will meet the road that will take you home. Believe me, if I had foreseen this... I'm really terribly sorry, she said. We can't take chances, you know. Any chances. I'm only beginning to perceive what a terrible risk I was asking of you all. He sighed and shook his head. You remember? He asked. To Hillsdale and then exit five. Look. Eleanor was quiet for a minute, wanting to tell them all exactly how it was. I wasn't afraid, she said at last. I really wasn't afraid. I'm fine now. I was... happy. She looked earnestly at the doctor. Happy, she said. I don't know what to say, she said, afraid again that she was going to cry. I don't want to go away from here. There might be a next time, the doctor said sternly. Can't you understand that we cannot take that chance? How long have we been here? Helena asked suddenly. A, a little over a week. Why? It's the only time anything's ever happened to me. I liked it. That, said the doctor, is why you are leaving in such a hurry. Helena closed her eyes and sighed, feeling and hearing and smelling the house. Far away, upstairs, Perhaps in the nursery. A little eddy of wind gathered itself and swept along the floor, carrying dust. In the library, the iron stairway swayed, and Mrs. Dudley was setting the lunch table for five. Hill House watched, arrogant and patient. I won't go away, Eleanor said up to the high windows. You will go away the doctor said, showing his impatience at last. Right now. Eleanor laughed and turned, holding out her hand. Luke, she said, and he came toward her, silent. Thank you for bringing me down last night. That was wrong of me, I know it now, and you were very brave. I was indeed, Luke said. It was an act of courage far surpassing any other in my life. And I'm glad to see you going now, because I would certainly never do it again. Far away, in the little parlour, the ash dropped softly in the fireplace. And who do I thank for a lovely time? The doctor took her by the arm and, with Luke beside her, led her to her car and opened the door for her. The carton was still on the back seat. Her suitcase was on the floor, her coat and purse on the seat. Luke had left the engine running. 
Doctor, Eleanor said, clutching at him. Doctor? I'm sorry, he said. Goodbye. Drive carefully, Luke said politely. You can't just make me go, she said wildly. You brought me here. And I'm sending you away, the doctor said. We won't forget you, Eleanor, but right now the only important thing for you is to forget Hill House and all of us. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs Montague said firmly from the steps. Then Eleanor, her hand on the door of the car, stopped and turned. Theo? She said inquiringly, and Theodora ran down the steps to her. Oh, I thought you weren't going to say goodbye to me, she said. Oh, Nellie, my Nell, be happy. Please be happy. Some day things really will be all right again, and you'll write me letters and I'll answer, and we'll visit each other. Oh, Nellie, I thought you weren't going to say goodbye to me. She put out a hand to touch Eleanor's cheek. Nell, please be careful. Goodbye, Eleanor said, and slid into the car. It felt unfamiliar and awkward. Goodbye, she called, wondering if there had ever been another word for her to say. Clumsily, her hands fumbling, she released the brake and let the car move slowly. They waved back at her dutifully, standing still, watching her. They will watch me down the drive as far as they can see, she thought. So now I am going. Journey's end in lovers' meeting. But I won't go, she thought, and laughed aloud to herself. Hill House is not as easy as they are. It's just by telling me to go away, they can't make me leave. Not if Hill House means me to stay. With what she perceived as quick cleverness, she pressed her foot down hard on the accelerator. They can't run fast enough to catch me this time, she thought. But by now, they must be beginning to realise. I wonder who notices first. Luke, almost certainly. I can hear them calling now, she thought. And the little footsteps running through Hill House, and the soft sound of the hills pressing closer. I am really doing it, she thought, turning the wheel to send the car directly at the great tree at the curve of the driveway. I am really doing it. I'm doing this all by myself, now, at last. This is me. I am really, really, really doing it by myself. In the unending, crashing second, before the car hurled into the tree, she thought clearly, Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why don't they stop me? Mrs Sanderson, Luke's aunt, was enormously relieved to hear that Dr Montague and his party had left Hill House. She would have turned them out, she told the family lawyer, if Dr Montague had shown any sign of wanting to stay. Theodora's friend, mollified and contrite, was delighted to see Theodora back so soon. Luke took himself off to Paris, where his aunt fervently hoped he would stay for a while. Dr Montague finally retired from active scholarly pursuits after the cool, almost contemptuous reception of his preliminary article, analysing the psychic phenomena of Hill House. Hill House itself, not sane, stood against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for eighty years, and might stand for eighty more. Within, its walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there, walked alone. So that's it from The Haunting of Hill House. The book was written by Shirley Jackson, abridged by Alison Joseph, read by Emma Fielding, and the producer was Gemma Jackson.